Chapter 1. Power is a delicate thing. It is capable of protecting evil and obscuring the truth. Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. In 2017, Ronan Farrow stumbled on an investigation that led him to Harvey Weinstein's crimes. He wasn't the first to discover this, but he was the only one brave enough to want to uncover the evil that Weinstein had managed to perpetuate over time. Harvey Weinstein was a well-known producer, greatly respected, and of course, feared by many people in Hollywood and the media. He was the maker of talent and the godfather of many actors and actresses. But this maker was also a destroyer, a fact that these same people were afraid of. This summary details the untold stories that led to the fall of Weinstein and explains the effort that the media put into protecting powerful people from being hit by the long arm of the law. Keep reading to understand better how Faro destroyed the culture of silence that surrounded Weinstein's continued sexual abuse and broke a story that shook the world to its foundations. Chapter 2 It was difficult to believe Harvey Weinstein, who supported charitable causes, could be a sexual predator. The movie industry had never seen anyone like Harvey Weinstein. With over 300 Oscar nominations under his belt, he was every actor's dream producer. He started his first company, Miramax, with his brother Bob, which Disney acquired in the early 90s. When this acquisition failed, he started the Weinstein Company. Harvey Weinstein usually threatened actresses with unemployment to get them to keep quiet. But apart from being the dream producer, he was a predator. He not only bullied his business partners and actors, but he also sexually assaulted them. People found this difficult to believe because he not only supported many humanitarian causes, he was a vital part of Hillary Clinton's campaign team. He was able to raise a lot of money for Clinton while always maintaining a calm and fatherly facade. Many journalists shied away from reporting the negative stories that trailed powerful men such as Weinstein, but in October 2016, sexual allegations against Bill Cosby and Donald Trump emerged. Women in at least 15 cities staged sit-ins and marches at Trump's buildings to protest, and four women claimed he assaulted them. Ronan Farrow and Rich McHugh worked together on various investigative stories and found that while other reporters kept avoiding sexual assault stories, some others were not. Among these brave journalists was Billy Bush, anchor of a celebrity news program, Access Hollywood. He openly spoke about the predators and how Hollywood was full of them. They found the information gathered from Bush and Access Hollywood a good start for their investigation into Weinstein and other predators. Chapter 3. Every victim that came forward to accuse Weinstein of sexual abuse was either paid off or labeled crazy by the media. The media industry was a different world entirely. The secrets it contained seemed inexhaustible, and for every hidden information that was uncovered, more dirt seemed to pop up. In the first week of November 2016, just before the election, Dylan Howard, editor-in-chief of the National Enquirer, ordered that all the dirt he had accumulated on Trump be destroyed. This was a reaction to Wall Street Journal's inquiry about Howard's involvement in the American Media Inc.'s AMI, hiding Donald Trump's allegations. AMI routinely withheld the publication of damaging information in exchange for tips or exclusives in what the staff popularly referred to as blackmail. In 2015, AMI struck a production deal with Harvey Weinstein. The deal was said to be a creation of a television show from the company's site, but in fact was a means to cover Weinstein's crimes. The growing relationship between Trump and AMI's CEO David Pecker ensured that negative Trump stories were not published and that they painted Hillary Clinton in the worst ways possible. It also clamped down on Ashley Judd and Rose McGowan's attempts at exposing Harvey Weinstein for sexual harassment. And instead of reporting these stories they shared about Weinstein, AMI labeled them as mentally unstable, or as in the case of a model, made her sign a non-disclosure agreement after buying the rights to her story. Harvey Weinstein knew almost everyone in the media, so he used these connections to cover his crimes. Chapter 4. Journalists tried to report the Weinstein story, but they stopped because they couldn't afford to risk their careers. Many actresses refused to share their sexual harassment stories, but not Rose McGowan. Barrow had first met her in 2010 and realized that she was quick to express her disapproval of the patriarchal structures in Hollywood. Barrow was determined to expose sexual predators because her sister was also a victim of sexual abuse. Other journalists, such as Seth Friedman, an English writer for The Guardian, were trying to reach McGowan, too, and it seemed like she was being pressured. After speaking with McGowan, Farrow interviewed Dennis Rice, a veteran marketing executive who revealed that Merrimax paid off women who were bullied or sexually abused by Harvey Weinstein. He went on to say that he had witnessed Weinstein touch young women inappropriately on different occasions, and these women were warned that they'd lose their careers if they said anything. The list of women who were rumored to have voiced complaints about Harvey Weinstein kept growing. And certain names, such as Rose McGowan's and Italian actress Asia Argento, kept coming up. When McGowan narrated her ordeal on camera, she recounted how she was raped and given $100,000 as a guarantee of her silence. As Faro tried to gather more evidence to support McGowan's account, some people also tried to warn Faro not to continue the story. Donna Gigliotti, the Shakespeare in Love producer, was one of them. She vehemently tried to convince him that he had a lot to lose if he continued, but this only fueled Faro's desire to know the truth. Chapter 5 like every other story about powerful people, the Weinstein story needed a lot of evidence. Noah Oppenheim was just promoted to president of NBC News, and Faro thought it a good idea to let him in on the progress he had made so far with McGowan and the other Miramax executives who had given their version of the Weinstein story. But this was not enough to run a story. 
Oppenheim insisted that more evidence had to be found. Faro set out to do this by finding more victims to interview. Many people feared for their families, careers, and children and refused to share their experiences. On recommendation from the editor of The Hollywood Reporter, Matt Baloney, Faro called Gavin Polone, the former agent and manager who was now a successful producer. Polone had written a column about Bill Cosby, and so it seemed he shared Faro's interests. Polone had one piece of advice. He wanted Faro to expose Weinstein in the most convincing way possible. He mentioned that Annabelle Sciorra was also a Weinstein victim and warned Faro to be careful and get a gun if he could. Although Faro admitted to receiving threats on Instagram and a feeling of being followed, he refused to purchase a gun. Chapter 6. Harvey Weinstein's team made sure to use the victim's past as a counter to their allegations. There was only one allegation against Weinstein that had entered the criminal justice system. It was a report made in 2015 by a one-time finalist in the Miss Italy pageant, Ambra Batalana Gutierrez. Faro contacted Ambra Gutierrez through her lawyer and she agreed to meet. Amber Gutierrez's story was proof that with enough money and power, one can make anything disappear. She detailed how Harvey Weinstein tried to grope her during a meeting in his Tribecan office. And when she reported to the police, they suggested that she go for her second scheduled meeting with him wearing a wire while she attempted to extract a confession from him. But this did not go as planned. Although officers arrested him at the hotel, no charges were pressed because soon news broke that Gutierrez was a prostitute. On April 20, 2015, she received a settlement of $1 million and signed away her rights to talk publicly about or charge Weinstein. What they didn't know was that the 18-page long agreement was not enough to get Amber Gutierrez to destroy all the evidence of his assault, which were saved in three audio files labeled Mama 1, Mama 2, and Mama 3 in her laptop. In the files, Weinstein could be heard admitting to his sexual assault, promising her a career advancement, and mentioning the names of other actresses he had helped, while Gutierrez kept trying to refuse his advances. Weinstein usually chose hotels as meeting points because of the privacy they offered. After a few weeks, Gutierrez was ready to let NBC's legal department hear the audio tape, even though she had not decided whether or not she wanted to hand it in as evidence. On advice from his sister, Dylan Faro contacted Lisa Bloom, a lawyer who was passionate about defending survivors of sexual violence. She gave him the names of attorneys with experience in cases involving non-disclosure agreements, and even offered to connect him directly to Harvey Weinstein and his lawyer, David Boyce. Chapter 7. Non-disclosure agreements prevented Weinstein's victims from publicly discussing their encounter with him. Harvey Weinstein had a feeling something was wrong and kept asking his lawyer, David Boys, if NBC was running a story. Boys replied in the negative each time. After Boys made some inquiries, he began to hear news about Faro and how he had been making investigations into Weinstein's crimes. After Boys made a call to studio head Andy Lack and network head Phil Griffin, they promised to look into Faro's story. The long pauses that NBC ordered on Faro's investigation made it difficult to reassure victims of the story's potential success. Richard Greenberg, interim head of NBC's investigative unit, refused to commit to having a meeting with Gutierrez so she could play the audio. He kept insisting that Faro should focus on other things, such as a book on foreign policy that he was writing. At this point, no victim wanted to speak anymore. Faro tried reaching Annabella Sciorra, who he had heard from multiple sources had been assaulted by Weinstein, but she also said she had nothing to say. A call from Matthew Hildzik, a prominent publicist, warning him about his ongoing investigation of Weinstein made Faro even more confused about the whole situation. Chapter 8. Weinstein's employees helped him with whatever he wanted because they didn't want to lose their jobs. On contacting Ken Oletta, a former writer at The New Yorker who started an investigation on Weinstein in 2002 but couldn't continue for lack of evidence, Barrow was even more convinced that the allegations were worth investigating. The main problem was how to carry out the investigation without offending Greenberg, who had asked him to stop working on the case. Weinstein was so powerful that it seemed almost impossible to successfully nail him. Faro learned from the New York Magazine writer behind the most recent attempt at the Weinstein story, Ben Wallace, that everything he did somehow found a way to get back to Weinstein. Wallace suggested that some people might be double agents conveying their findings to Weinstein. He mentioned that a lady named Anna and former writer for The Guardian, Seth Friedman, had been the most suspicious. Since he could not make progress on the investigation in January 2017, Wallace gave up on the Weinstein story. Faro decided he would not let the story go the way Wallace did. He resolved to try his best to bring Weinstein down. He tried to think of ways to get the recording of Weinstein admitting to his crimes from Gutierrez. He realized that he could make a new recording of her playing the audio that she had. This reduced the risk it posed and meant that they didn't transfer anything. But having this recording made Faro more anxious. He kept getting threats from a mysterious Instagram handle. This time, they sent a picture of a pistol. Through Ben Wallace's help, Faro was able to meet Weinstein's former assistant, Emily Nestor, who agreed to go on air. She also brought along hard evidence in the form of messages from Erwin Ryder, a senior executive who had worked with Weinstein for almost 30 years acknowledging the incident and agreeing that it was a pattern of predation in the company. Nestor told her story clearly. She was 25 when she started to work at the Weinstein Company in 2014, and he wasted no time getting her number. He insisted she meet him for drinks, which she declined, and offered an early coffee instead. He accepted and chose the Peninsula Hotel as the venue. While they were having coffee, he offered her a career boost and asked that she be his girlfriend as other famous actresses were. She told a friend about this occurrence, and he alerted the company's Office of Human Resources for her. 
She also explained that his assistants were privy to everything that Weinstein did to young women and would even sometimes be present at the beginning of such meetings so the victims can feel comfortable. Did you know, Weinstein had his assistants keep track of the women he harassed in a file named FOH, Friends of Harvey. Chapter 9. Harvey Weinstein paid the Black Cube to carry out his investigations and stalk his rivals. Weinstein was having problems with the Black Cube, a group of highly experienced and trained in Israel's elite military and governmental intelligence units. Bowie's firm and the Black Cube signed a confidential agreement and marked the beginning of aggressive operations to stop the publication of allegations against him. These operations were referred to as Phase 2A and Phase 2B. Weinstein's problems with the Black Cube stemmed from the fear that their work had broken the law and created further problems for him, and this prevented him from paying the agreed fees of $600,000. After further negotiation, it was agreed that he would pay them $190,000. Barrow knew the story had to be run, and soon, but he needed to put the evidence he had gathered, a list of sources, transcripts of conversations, and audio gotten from Gutierrez, and a description of patterns and settlements, in a safe deposit box at the Bank of America. Faro felt it was important to protect these documents since he might be in danger. Faro's search led him to information gathered by other writers, such as Jennifer Jennifer Sr. and Jim Carr, who had died in 2015. When Greenberg heard the audio tape and saw the list of sources Faro and McHugh had gathered, he was convinced that they had strong evidence against Weinstein. The circle of people who agreed to grant an interview on camera kept increasing. Katrina Wolf, a former assistant who later became an executive, went on camera revealing that two female employees accused Weinstein of sexual assault and were settled out of court. Nothing stopping Harvey. He will squash this story. Donna Gigliotti. Chapter 10. Every piece of evidence had a positive effect. It convinced more victims to come forward and share their stories. Barrow had the opportunity to go through Alletta's files and saw that many pieces of the Weinstein case were fitting perfectly. It detailed how he harassed an employee, Zelda Perkins, because she had to work close to him and eventually shifted this attention to her assistant, Rowena Chiu. Chiu and Perkins both resigned and received a settlement of 250,000 pounds to be shared equally between them in exchange for their silence. The script of the Weinstein story was straightforward. It included the audio tape with credits to Gutierrez, McGowan's account on camera, and Nestor's interview with Erwin Reader's messages as evidence. Former employees' contributions were also included, as well as the uncovered settlements and negotiations that were traced back to Weinstein's account. Faro's story experienced many delays because of the many people that needed to approve it. After the script was looked over by Susan Weiner, the general counsel of NBC News and deemed satisfactory, it still didn't sit well with Noah Oppenheim, executive producer of Today Show. He insisted they wait for another lawyer's verdict before running the story. The heads at NBC Universal decided to do a legal review of the story. This turned the tables as NBC's general counsel, Kim Harris, informed them that the script on Weinstein made them open to a tortious interference argument. She asked that they work on a better script that didn't have the potential of a lawsuit. Farrow had to pause the investigation and cancel scheduled interviews on Oppenheim's insistence. Chapter 11. Ronan Farrow chose to continue with the Weinstein story, even when his job was on the line. Farrow had a new lead. Ali Canosa. She had worked with Weinstein since 2010 and confirmed her willingness to share her story of how Harvey Weinstein sexually abused her repeatedly. With everything going on, former New York State Governor George Pataki was quick to inform Harvey Weinstein about Faro's continued involvement in the case. Weinstein contacted NBC officials who reassured him that everything was under control. In August 2018, Greenberg informed Faro that the edited version of the script had been approved, but Oppenheim and Andy had not agreed to air it. Faro was accused of being obsessed with Weinstein's story because of his sister's past history of sexual abuse. They also feared that there could be a problem of conflict of interest. For this reason, they still refused to run it. It was obvious NBC wasn't going to let the Weinstein story see the light of day, and to reinforce this, they seized all the materials Faro and McHugh had gathered from different sources. Luckily, McHugh had a backup file he made from the original document, which he quickly deposited in a safe deposit box. He made a call to Aletta to inquire if The New Yorker would run the story instead. The next day, Aletta introduced Faro to the editor of The New Yorker, David Remnick. The probability of the New Yorker accepting the script and airing the story was pretty slim, but after much deliberation, Faro was allowed to work with a young editor, Deirdre Foley Mendelssohn. On September 11, 2018, Oppenheim told Faro that the network had no room in the budget for him anymore and couldn't commit to a regular job. He was also warned to discontinue his reference to his time at NBC during his investigation. Faro got help from the New Yorker when NBC refused to support his story, and this increased his chances of success. It was at this point that Faro began receiving legal threats from Weinstein's legal team. He was warned not to use any interviews, to turn in his work products, and that if he used any content, he would be sued for defamation of character. He refused to accede to the threats and continued the investigation. Chapter 12. Many actresses asked that they remain anonymous when they shared their stories. Faro was able to convince award-winning actress Mira Servino, the daughter of actor Paul Servino, to talk about her Weinstein experience. She chronicled how Weinstein had tried to massage her shoulders and make her uncomfortable. He also tried to force herself into her room at night, and this memory haunted her since. 
Rosanna Arcat confirmed this story too and shared the belief that Mira's career suffered because she refused him. Italian actress Asia Argento also recounted the story of how she was invited to a party thrown by Miramax, and the head of Miramax Italy led her to Weinstein's hotel room, where he forced himself on her. When Sophie Dix, an English actress, also shared her Weinstein hotel experience, which was corroborated by family and friends that she told, Faro knew the story was untouchable. But not everything was going well. Every day presented more dead ends as many people kept withdrawing because of the fear of Weinstein. Asia Argento's partner, Anthony Bourdain, encouraged Faro to press on and continue the story, even when it felt like nothing was going well. The New Yorker's work on the story increased as Foley Mendelssohn and Remnick went over the scripts. Two reporters, Megan Tui and Jody Cantor, were leading the investigation aggressively and assuring everything went fine. Weinstein sent his first legal letter to the New Yorker as fact-checkers began calling sources widely. But as far as Weinstein was willing to sue, Remnick assured Faro that he would offer legal protection. The Hollywood Reporter and Variety ran stories of a possible battle between Weinstein and the New Yorker over a potentially explosive story, and this made Weinstein and his team fearful. When Weinstein received a call from Faro for a comment, he responded by letting him know that he was barking up the wrong tree and couldn't save everyone. He further added that future questions be sent to a member of his legal team, Lisa Bloom. More people kept coming forward with their stories as the script was being reviewed. Among them was Lucia Evans, a marketing consultant. She accused Weinstein of forcing her to perform oral sex on him in 2004 after he tricked her into a meeting that never held. On October 10, 2018, Foley Mendelssohn circulated the final edit of the story, and the story ran. People began to contact Faro for comment as this story had broken the internet. Chapter 13. Many media houses killed the negative stories of powerful people in exchange for funding or other benefits. Seth Friedman, a former stockbroker and now writer, contacted Faro and expressed interest in the story. In the course of the discussion, Friedman informed Faro of the existence of the Black Cube. In an email Faro got from an anonymous source, he discovered that over $1.3 million had been spent on funding the Black Cube, and Boyas Schiller, whose law firm represented the New York Times, was privy to this. The collaborators that helped Weinstein were also published, and this shook the media a second time. Weinstein did not only have sexual crimes to deal with, he was also being investigated for misappropriation of funds. Sources in and around AMI insisted that Weinstein wasn't the only figure who ought to be exposed. Lawyer Carol Heller wrote to Faro saying that an American model, Karen McDougal, signed her rights to speak about her affair with Donald Trump. On Faro's urging, she began to share her story. She dated Trump for nine months and ended it because she felt guilty for having an affair. Trump was also said to have fathered a child with his former housekeeper, but this wasn't backed with by convincing evidence. All AMI employees admitted that this was how many stories disappeared due to lack of evidence. Reporting around people such as Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, Tiger Woods, Mark Wahlberg, and too many others were shelved because AMI bought them and buried them in a method called catch and kill. Chapter 14. Other powerful men such as Donald Trump and Arnold Schwarzenegger were also predators whose victims wanted justice. Faro got a text from Igor Ostrovsky, a Ukrainian black cube operative who had been stalking him all along. He showed Faro evidence of their activities and feared it might be illegal. Through 2018, Faro kept reporting on the world of Israeli intelligence, poking at the black cube in the process. NBC also had sexual assault accusations against Matt Lauer, co-host of NBC's Today Show. Matt was eventually fired following an allegation against him by a female colleague. Other people were also found guilty of sexual abuse in the workplace as many women began telling their stories. The Weinstein story triggered a chain of reactions in the media world. More criminals were being brought to book. Mark Halperin, NBC's most prominent political analyst, was fired after five women came out to say that he had been harassing them. Soon after, Matt Zimmerman, senior vice president of booking at The Today Show, was also fired for sleeping with two junior staff. Many people began to accuse NBC of having an unsafe work culture. The courage that the women had exposed all the underhanded attempts of these many men because the truth cannot be killed. Conclusion There is a clear message in this summary. No matter how long evil has prevailed, the truth is strong enough to uncover it. Many women not only gained freedom from the Weinstein investigation, but they also found justice. This justice was not just for them, but the future, for women to freely express themselves and revel in their sexuality without fear of being sexually harassed. Many men like Weinstein exist, and it is everyone's duty to ensure that they are brought to face the consequences of their actions. Try this. Ensure that your organization or family is a safe space for everyone to say what bothers them. Also, organize events that encourage employees to speak up against sexual harassment and outline the consequences if they do occur.